Welcome to New Realities. This is Alan Steinfeld, and this program is about, I feel, the evolution of our consciousness, our society, our culture, and part of that is really getting back to nature. And that's why I'm talking today to Celeste Longacre. She's written a beautiful book called Celeste Garden Delights, and uh, welcome to the program, Celeste. Oh, well, I'm very happy to be here. So you and your husband are totally self-sufficient, living on six acres in New Hampshire. Is that, is that true? Well, we're not totally self-sufficient, but we do live a lifestyle that definitely, you know, is pretty self-sufficient, and it's, uh, it's, it's supportive. It, it doesn't hurt the, the earth. Well, you know, I mean, I love everything you've talked about in your book, your recipes and your cooking and your pres pres preserving of food, but... Can we just talk to the people in New York City and all the cities around the world and the country that are listening to this about, you know, how practical can we be close to self-sufficient within these urban environments? Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, you know, I think that it doesn't really matter where you live. Um, you know, now that we have wonderful farmers markets all across the country, I think it's important to support our farmers. So the more that you can shop locally and participate in that, you know, anybody can take a little bit of time in the summertime when there's lots of berries to be had at the markets and buy a couple of boxes of berries and come home and throw some down on your cookie sheets and put them in the freezer and then put them in the bags once they've frozen individually and um, have some berries for the winter. It's uh, something that people can do. So in my book, I really talk about a lot of techniques for how to live sustainably, um, because that's really what it's all about. We need to get back to that sustainable type of living so that it will be, we'll be able to be here for uh, a lot more generations. Right. So what are some of the other techniques to living sustainably that you talk about? Well, you know, if you can, you can grow your own food. If you can't, you can participate in supporting the farmers. I have canning in there, so there's uh, there's when the tomatoes are coming in like gangbusters and you can buy them really, really cheap, you can put them in jars and then have them, you know, for the winter. We have a little rain barrel that we catch rain water, so we have, you know, water that we would otherwise just go into the ground that we can use to water the garden. Is it true that that's illegal in some states to catch yeah, rain? Yeah, isn't that kind of sad that that's illegal in some states? I can't believe it. It's, it's insane, you know. It is. It it's is. like but, charging you know, a lot for of the air. Way people do things, and a lot of the laws that we have really are kind of insane. Right? Can people grow their own food? Can I? Can people? What do you think about rooftop gardens and things yeah, like that? Yeah, there's rooftop gardens, or if you have a balcony, you can grow a couple of tomato plants. If you have a sunny balcony, in big pots. So there, mm -hmm. there are things that people can do, even if they live in the city. Or another thing that is really kind of popping up. It's a lot of cities and towns now are having community gardens. And they're, you know, where there is space, they're inviting people to come in and um, garden little bits of, of, you know, that particular garden. Right. No, I, I, I would do that. Actually, there's a garden down the street from me in New York. But I would like to put boxes on my roof and put, you know, good topsoil and grow things in that. I mean, is that practical, you think? Yeah, that's absolutely very practical. And also composting. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff, I think, in fact, most of the waste in cities is actually food waste, which could be composted and turned into this beautiful, rich, lush, dark soil uh, if we had a way to do that. A lot of cities, like I know Portland, Maine, has two different businesses that will collect your compost, and then they will return to you free of charge, um, you know, your, your, your chicken, kitchen scraps, and they will return to you free of charge beautiful, rich compost that you can then use in your own gardens. Well, maybe there should be a company that will pay people for their compost. That would be a, a good way to get people to compost. That would be a good way to get people to compost. That's really interesting. That's an interesting yeah. idea. So, I mean, your book also talks about, yeah, the, pr the, pres the preserving process. Uh, and I don't know, I've just, I guess, been buying food in supermarkets too long. And I think, could I really trust food that I've preserved myself? Will it be good? Will it be spoiled? I mean, how do you know? Can you talk about that whole process? 
Well, I think that, you know, in fact, I do say a couple times in my book, if it smells bad or looks bad or tastes bad, don't eat it. You know, you don't want to take any chances. When in doubt, throw it out. But right. it really, you know, as far as canning is concerned, tomatoes are acidic. And, like, things like botulism can't live in an acidic environment. So you don't have to really worry about that. And if you have um, lids that are loose on a, on a jar, I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat that. Or if okay. things look bad, if they start to get brown, you can sort of tell when things are not, not doing well. But if you put a lot of stuff in the freezer and put it mm-hmm. in bags, it looks beautiful. It should look just as beautiful as the day that you stuck it in there. And if how it long can maybe you... that's not a good thing to eat. But how long can you actually freeze um, berries for? I would say, you know, a good year, um, maybe even as much as two years, but certainly throughout the winter, you know, during the season, the winter season, if, you've, if you have frozen some berries in the summer. Mm. And so I have you actually used berries that, that I had in there for over a year, and um, they were fine. So you can, you can, if you keep it consistently cold and consistently mm-hmm. frozen, they will keep for quite a long time. That's good to know. So you recommend a big walk-in freezer, huh? Well, I have two freezers. One is like a, it looks like a regular refrigerator, but it's completely a freezer. And then I have another one that's smaller and it opens on the top. And I, I, have, the, I have them in outbuildings. So in the wintertime, it doesn't cost me anything to run them because they, you know, the, the, in New Hampshire, the outdoors is so cold, it's keeping everything frozen. You can only do that with non-frost uh, free freezers, though. Non-frost free, because if you have a frost freezer it will frost you're saying no a frost free freezer what the freezer does is it it warms up every 24 or 48 hours it warms up and it takes that frost away so if you're in a really cold climate it's not going to be able to warm up and take that frost away so it's going to break oh i see i see so what do you grow on your land every summer what how, what do you actually have there oh we have all kinds of stuff we have Red cabbage and green cabbage and broccoli and um, Brussels sprouts, carrots, beets, onions, two different kinds of potatoes. One is a baking potato and one is a mashing potato. Lots of tomatoes, lots of garlic, oregano, thyme, basil, beans, green beans. Um, and do you live you live on that in the summer. You have to plant it in the spring, right? Yeah, uh, I, I plant it in April and May. Uh-huh. And then and I take what? care of it. We have a lot of lettuce, uh, radicchio I have planted. I have snow peas that are coming in now that are absolutely delicious. Well, if and you plant in the spring, here. if you plant in April and May, when can you start eating your food? Well, it's kind of a process. Like I, I always let my parsnips, leave my parsnips out in the garden through the winter so that when the, when the ground thaws, I can go out and collect the, the, the parsnips. And I have asparagus, which usually comes in in May. So in May, Mm -hmm. I'm eating the asparagus. I'll start some lettuces inside and put them out so that I can start having salads. Usually around the beginning of May, I can start having salads. Uh, You know, so there's there's definitely, I've been eating beet greens. I've been eating a lot of Swiss chard. Does kale grow? Oh, I just want to know. Kale, I heard, grows all through the winter. Is that true? Well, I think if you didn't live in as as cold a climate as we have, you might be able to keep kale growing all through the year. I have two different kinds of kale planted, but what I'll do is I'll put a little bit in the freezer. So I steam it a little bit, and then I put it into one bowl, and I put that bowl into another bowl that has ice water in it to cool it down, and then Mm -hmm. I put them into bags and I stick them in the freezer. And I really appreciate in the winter, you know, having those greens. I put beet greens in there, I'll put Swiss chard in there, and and kale, and uh, I can throw them in soups, I can throw them in stews, I can have them just heated up with a little bit of butter. And uh, that not only are they delicious, but they're so good for us. I mean, I, I, I mean, I appreciate you asking all the, answering all these questions, because the, really the only thing I know about food is that you buy it in the supermarket. And, um, you know, I, I'm like really ignorant as far as the whole process of, of growing food and that I mean, you know, of course, that's what we all live on. But um, and I love vegetables. I don't. I pretty much eat from the farmers market and and do all that. But uh, you know, what's your whole philosophy behind it? You know, what you're doing. Well, I actually read Adele Davis's "Let's Eat Right to Keep Fit" in the in the 1970s, 
And her book, the premise of her book was that if you want to be healthy, you really have to pay attention to what you eat. And that just blew my mind. I mean, it just blew me away. I thought, wow, that makes so much sense, you know, because when you put food into your mouth and into your body, you're actually putting the building blocks that your body is going to use to keep the cells healthy and to keep everything flowing like it should. And, you know, our bodies have have evolved over tens of thousands of years to eat real food, you know, and real food is potatoes and beets and carrots and and beef and, you know, bacon and things like that. And when you look at a lot of the stuff that's in the supermarket now, all of the processed food has lots of chemicals and lots of things we can't pronounce. And our bodies are not used to that. So what does our body do with that? We, we, who really knows what happens when that stuff gets into our bodies? But right. it's, uh, you know, like our grandparents and our great-grandparents wouldn't have dreamed of uh, not having a garden or not having a farm that they could go and visit and, you know, participate in some of the vegetables and, and the meats as well from those farms. So you feel it's okay to eat meat, right? Absolutely. I think actually we kind of need meat because uh, most of our ancestors have eaten that for a long time. But it you has know, to be I, good quality meat. I think yes. what the most the meat that most Americans eat come from those those confined animal farms, those CAFOs, and mm. I don't think that's particularly healthy because those animals are not happy. Um. And I think that everything carries the vibration of everything that it's been through. So, you know, I know there's a there's a lot of depression in this country now, and I'm, sometimes I wonder if it's because people are eating, you know, the meat of animals that were terribly depressed. Oh, that's a good point. No, but you're talking about no chemicals and all that, so... Um, of course, the GMO thing is out there. What do you, how, what, how do you deal with the whole GMO process? I, I avoid them like the plague. Because right. <laughs> they are the plague, actually. They are <laughs> the plague, that's right. No, I don't participate. You know, people forget. I think people feel, you know, disempowered because they forget that every single dollar that they spend has power. So where you choose to spend your dollars is so important. You know, if you spend your dollars and you buy those GMO things, you are empowering the companies that do the GMOs. But if you refuse to buy them and you go to the farmer's market and you support your local farmers, then you are actually participating in a more sustainable world. Right. No, absolutely. But some people say it's actually hard to find buy seeds that haven't been GMO'd. No, there's plenty of seed companies that you can buy seeds that haven't been GMO'd. There's okay, Johnny's, that's... there's Seeds of Change, there's Fedco, there's Pine Tree Gardens. I mean, I have a whole list of them in my book. Of oh, you do? That that's seeds. good. Because I was afraid, I mean, isn't because isn't Monsanto's really taking over the world? I mean, uh... Well, they're trying to, but we're trying, we're, we're, we're going to stand in their way. Uh-huh. Well, that's as good because... <laughs> We, you don't really know. No one knows how bad GMOs really are, but they can't be good for you. You know, it's, no, I'm sure they're not good for you. They're, and they're not just taking, you know, different kinds of like we've been for years, for decades, for for thousands of years, we've been sort of taking one to, kind of tomato and kind of mixing it with another kind of tomato and coming up with a new kind of tomato. GMOs, they're taking pieces of pig and putting them in tomatoes or pieces of. I mean, it just is bizarre to me to think that that's okay. That that is awful. That is yeah. how can that that should be illegal? And plus, owning and then they own the sea. How can you own life? You know, that's you know even even worse. I think in some ways, you know, that well, that's you have why to, we have to take the power back, and that's why we have to support our local farmers, and we have to be careful where we shop how we spend our dollars. You know, there are good companies out there. There are good seafood companies. There are good companies that do only grass-fed beef that you can even mail order um, from, from these companies. Vital Choice is a seafood company that, that a, they only do sustain, sustainable, wonderful fish. Uh, mm-hmm. Radiant Life has some good products. U.S. Wellness Meats, they only do grass-fed meats, and they have all different kinds of selections. They have really good hot dogs and liverwurst and um, only made with really good quality ingredients. So those companies are out there. What was the name of that last company? What was the name of that last company? They are out there. What was the name of that last company you mentioned? U.S. Wellness Meats. And you you really like those products? 
I love their stuff. Yeah, their hot dogs are unbelievably good. Really? I never liked hot dogs because it was always felt so... It's just awful. It tasted so bad. <laughs> You know, I've never had a good hot dog, I have to oh, tell you. Oh, try their garlic hot dogs. They are so good. What is it made? What's a hot dog made from? Is it beef or pork? Yeah, I think it's beef. I see. And, and some spices and they and garlic. And they, they, just, they just do a really nice job. And they also make a really nice liverwurst. Well, what's a liver? What is liverwurst? Liverwurst is made with liver, you know. It, I'm sure it has other ingredients in it as well. But they, they make a nice liverwurst that comes like in a hard roll, mm. um, maybe two inches around, and, it's, and then it's maybe six inches long. And what I like to do with it is I like to, it's frozen, so and, it, and it, even when it thaws, it's pretty hard. So I like to slice it up like sausages and cook it in butter and then dose it with a, a butter, um, half butter, half Worcestershire sauce. Mm. Delicious. Absolutely. Well, you, you know, people sounds- have this idea, I think, that, that food that's good for you doesn't taste good. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you eat I- food that's good for you and it's cooked right, it is unbelievably delicious. I agree with you. When I've had carrots right out of the ground, they, they were not only delicious, but they were really filling. They filled me up, you mm-hmm. know? And yep. I, it's like it, I didn't have to eat that much of them, so... I mean, what you're doing is really valuable. What you're, you know, talking about is very valuable for people. You know, the thing about a hot dog, getting back to hot dogs, those were originally sausages, and that was another way of preserving food by making a sausage out of it, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, right. And was the original sausage wrapped in like a cow's intestine? Is that what? Something like that, yeah. But see, another thing I think that's missing from Americans' diet is fermented foods. Yeah, talk Our ancestors, about them. they used to ferment their ketchup and their mayonnaise and their relishes and their pickles. They were all fermented. And fermented foods have probiotics in them and they also have digestive enzymes. So they would help us to digest our foods. And I think that's something that we can get back to 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 doing fermented foods. I make our all of our mayonnaise and ketchup and I ferment it. And I make our pickles and relishes and I ferment it. And I make a, a, a beet kvass and a fruit kvass which is a fermented fruit drink or a fermented beet drink. And mm-hmm. um, basically it's very easy to make a, a fruit kvass. You just take whatever fruits you have around and cut them up and put them in a jar. I use a half a gallon jar and mm-hmm. put a, a teaspoon of salt in there. And you have to have really good water, water that doesn't have chlorine or fluoride or anything in it, but you fill it up with water, leave mm-hmm. an inch of air at the top, put the cap on tight, and then I shake it several times a day. I put a towel around it. Shake it several times a day. Maybe once a day, just open up the cap a little bit to let the gases out. And after mm-hmm. two days, it, it will ferment, the, the salt will ferment the fruit in there. And then I, I strain out the fruit, and I put it in the refrigerator, and I put just a splash of that in all the glasses of water that I drink all day long. And since I've been doing that, I started doing that about four years ago, and since I've been doing that, I have not been sick once. Wait, wait, let me see if I understand the process. So I would take fruit, like what kind of fruit would you write? Like, could I take like blueberries or something? Yep. Blueberries, so pick- you might want to mash them a little bit. Anything that has a tough skin, just because you want the oh. bacteria, to, the good bacteria to be able to get in there. But you could do, you can do also vegetables. Like if you make a pumpkin pie and you've got yes. half a pumpkin left, ferment it, you know, make a, make a pumpkin kvass out of it. So wait, it wait. ends up being really inexpensive. And you get these wonderful, wonderful probiotics. And I think what happens is the bacteria that gets created by the fermentation process, the bacteria eats the sugars. So what you end up with is stuff that has hardly any calories, but it still retains all the vitamins and minerals, and the process of fermenting actually makes the vitamins and minerals more available to your body. So you well, absorb let me see, them better. Let me see if I understand how to do this. Um, you... You cut up your vegetable. I mean, peaches might be a good thing in the mm-hmm. summer, right? So I cut up like peaches uh, throughout yep. the pit and then put it in a jar, about a gallon or even a half gallon. Fill that jar up with, uh, with water. I mean, what I... You need the salt, I st- too. The salt is what how creates much the, salt the fermentation. I put in? How much salt do I put in a half a gallon of... of I would put in a teaspoon. And, it, a and te- it needs to be good quality salt, like sea salt... Not or, regular or, table salt. Or Celtic sea salt. Do you like Celtic sea yep, salt? Yep, it could be Celtic sea salt. Or it could you even be that, Himalayan pink. 
Oh, really? That's okay? Yeah. Because that's not yeah. a sea salt, actually. It's a mountain salt. But, um, right, but it's a salt. Okay, so you put a teaspoon. Wait, you put a teaspoon of that in yeah. a jar? or what, uh, If I was doing a half-gallon jar, right, right. how much fruit would I put in a half-gallon jar? It doesn't really matter. You can put in a little bit of fruit or you can put in a lot of fruit. It really depends on what you like. And and you kind of what I do is I I make it with different things because different vegetables and fruits are going to attract different types of bacteria, and the more different types of good bacteria you can give to your body, the better it is. The more the more healthy it is. Right. So okay. So I fill up a, a jar. I mean, then I fill it up with very clean water, good quality water. I put a teaspoon of good quality salt in, and then I yep. screw like the cap on the mason jar tight, and then I. Shake it up every couple of times a day, right? Yep, two, three times and a day. Shake it up. Make sure you leave a headspace so there's an inch of air at the top. Okay, so I shake it up, and then sometimes I open it to let out the gases. And then, does it have to be in the dark, or it doesn't matter? Yeah, you should put a towel around it to make it dark. And then, yeah, to make it how dark. long? And how long does that sit for then? Well, if you have a really warm kitchen, you only need to, to do it for two days. If you have a cooler kitchen, you might want to do it for three. All right, so it only sits for a few days then, and then you 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 take that water that's been you in there. Drain out the fruit. What I do is I just pour it through a strainer into another jar, and then I put it in the refrigerator. And then, wait, you throw the fruit out? Yep. You, if you, or, or, um, um, if you tend to be constipated, you might want to eat the fruit for the fiber, but I don't keep. I don't throw it away. I compost it. But, you but I don't. Eat I don't eat the fruit. I, I compost the fruit, and I just keep the the juice, the water, and I put it in the refrigerator, and I put just a splash in every glass of water that I have all day long. And that then that kind of ferments the water a little. What does it do to the water? Well, the water absorbs the vitamins and the minerals from the fruit. So you're getting Uh all the good stuff from the fruit, plus you're getting probiotics that have been created by the fermentation process. So when you say a splash, is that like a teaspoon? What is a splash? Okay, well, if I had a big glass of water, maybe a quarter cup. A quarter cup of that liquid? That's a lot, though, for a It is, and if you're not used to ferments, I would start with a teaspoon. Oh, I see. So yeah, let, because let's, you, if you're not used to ferments, I mean, they, they'll do wonderful things for you, and they'll, they'll help your body to detoxify. But if your body detoxifies too quickly, it can make you feel kind of ill. So definitely start really slow if you're not used to fermented foods. Just take a it, teaspoon a day, and then two teaspoons a day, and then three teaspoons a day. And you work your way up. Now I have it all the time. Could you just have it, like, straight on without adding it to water? Is that too much? Um, you know, I, I, my stomach kind of, kind of complains when I do that, so I oh. always make it a splash in a glass of water. Okay, okay. So how would you make mayonnaise yourself? I mean, how would you do that? Okay, I take three raw egg yolks, and you'd have to make sure that you got these eggs from someplace where you could tell that the chickens were absolutely healthy. I have my own chickens, so I know what? that my eggs are, are, are healthy. So I do three raw egg yolks. And yeah. a dash of mustard. I put in a quarter teaspoon of wait, turmeric. Wait, what, what kind of mustard do you use? Wait, of wait, 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 what kind of mustard do you use? Because it's hard to get real mustard. Um, you know, I, I'm not real fussy about the mustard. I just put okay. in whatever I can find, even okay. even a, a, so, like a jar of mustard, a regular jar of mustard, just a little bit, just maybe a quarter okay. teaspoon. So three egg yolks, a little dash of mustard. Then what were you saying? Then I do put in a quarter teaspoon of turmeric and okay. a quarter teaspoon of cumin yes, and a dash of salt. Okay. And then I mix that all up in my food processor. And then I take three quarters of a cup of sunflower oil and I very, very, very slowly drizzle it in while the, while the food processor is going around. Yes. And when all of that is in, I have my mayonnaise. And actually, if I'm going to ferment it, I also add a teaspoon of um, whey, homemade uh, whey, uh-huh. and I add a little bit of lemon, maybe a teaspoon of fresh lemon juice, too. You can make it without fermenting it you, if you don't have any whey. Okay. And uh, then you would just put it in the refrigerator and use it up. But if you ferment it, if you want to ferment it, what I do is I leave it on the counter overnight, and then I put it in the refrigerator. And I make two batches, and it fills up 
a three quarter, uh, a pint and a half jar. Wait, so you leave it out when you put a little bit of whey in there to ferment it and then you can leave it out. You don't have to refrigerate it. You're saying you leave it out just overnight mm -hmm. because that's, mm -hmm. it's just like the, the fruit kvass takes a couple days to ferment. Mm -hmm. So the mayonnaise okay. just le takes a few hours to ferment. So I leave Wait. it on the counter overnight and, to, and that will ferment it. And then we put it in the fridge. Wait, what is whey? I've heard of whey. I know it's in your book, but can, what whey is uh, made from whey milk? Whey is the liquid part of milk. Okay, like if you so you set milk on the counter, if you got if you had raw milk, you could set it on the counter for a few days, and it would separate into the curds and the whey, and the curds wait, wait. are the solid part, and the whey is the liquid part. But you can get whey from yogurt, and you don't wait. have to you don't have to wait till it separates. So you could make your own whey by taking a, some yogurt. And uh -huh. taking a strainer and putting the strainer over a bowl and putting a piece of cheesecloth in the strainer. And then you would put the, the yogurt into the cheesecloth and the, the curds would stay in the cheesecloth and the whey would come through. You don't eat the curds. You I don't the eat the curds. You can. You can actually. It, it would make a nice spread. You could put some chives in it or something else that you liked. Wait, and, wait, yeah, wait, you wait, can eat me, the curds. That's, wait, that's not oh, a problem. Oh, oh, oh. Wait a little slower so I can absorb this, digest it. <laughs> but okay, I have a bottle of milk, pretty a raw milk or as raw as I can get. I leave it out for how long? It depends on how warm your house is, and it depends on sometimes it it, it separates in three days. Sometimes it takes six or seven, but you and have to I wait leave, until you see it separating. And do I leave? Take the? It doesn't it? Isn't it like spoil though? Isn't like got? Uh, Not if it's raw milk. If, if it's, it's raw, raw milk, milk, yes, it will spoil. If it's raw milk that has not been refrigerated yet, right? No, it can have been refrigerated. Again. It's just, it okay. just really needs to be good quality raw milk. Okay, so I take the raw milk, I leave it out for three days, and with the tap on the bottle, with the bo top cup off? The cap is on the bottle, but lightly. You just want to have the cap on so nothing falls into it. All right. But so you don't then want it tight. Then the kind of watery stuff of the milk floats to the top, and then the um, the heavy stuff is, is sinks to the bottom, right? No, it doesn't do that. It just kind of separates. You kind of, if you look at it, it's it it there's a, it kind of separates. It looks like you oh. can see the 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 um, the curds are sort of forming, and the whey is kind of forming. Sometimes it will look like lines up and down. Uh, but it and sometimes it does separate. I think the the curds might come to the top, but it doesn't always do that. Okay. Then I pour that whole thing through a cheesecloth, so I just get the liquids and not the solids, right? Right. And that's whey. Yep. And what is whey good for? Why do people to ferment? Is it fermented then the whey? Or well, not? the whey is full of lactobacillus, and lactobacillus is one of the bacteria that's really, really good for us. It, okay. it really helps us to stay healthy. Do I have it's to? A, re but do I refrigerate my whey then? Then I yes, then I do refrigerate the whey. Okay, and, and then you can, and then what do you else do? You, what do, where do you add whey to? Well, I put it into my mayonnaise when I want to ferment. I put it in everything that I ferment. So I put it in my ketchup. I put it in my sauerkraut. I put it in my beet kvass and my fruit kvass. Um, oh, I see. And you can ferment things without whey. You don't absolutely have to have whey, but I like to use it because it adds more good probiotic bacteria to whatever else I'm eating or drinking. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, good. I mean, I really like the idea of fermented food. My body really likes, like, good quality sauerkraut, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and fresh cabbages and uh, yeah. Let's talk about can we can we go a little bit deeper into fermentation and and, and sauerkraut and 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 because this there is a kind of fermentation movement in the city. There are people gathering together in meetup groups talking about fermenting foods mm -hmm. and making. So how would I make a, a sauerkraut? Okay, well, what you would you do is you would take a cabbage. <laughs> And you yes. would shred it somehow, either with a knife or with a food processor. And you'd put it in a great big, huge bowl. And then I would add some whey, you know, maybe a couple of tablespoons of whey and a bunch of salt, like a, maybe a, a couple teaspoons of salt, maybe three teaspoons of salt. And then you pound it. So I use a meat pounder and I wear gloves on my hands because I've, I've gotten blisters on my hands from not wearing gloves, just regular rubber gloves. And Why I also do you have always pound? use the same bowl because you're going to dent the bowl. 
But why do you have to pound your, your, your cabbage? Because you want to, it releases the juices, and you, you need to get the juices released in order to start that fermentation process. Oh, I see, I see. So you pound it and pound it and pound it, and the, the juices get released. You and have to do it by hand. lots of liquid there. Then what I do is I put it in, a, again, a half a gallon jar, and I, I, push the, the, I push it down to the bottom because all of the food has to stay under the liquid. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. okay, so I, I kind of push it down, um, mm-hmm. and then what I do is I take a, like a little Ziploc pint bag and put some water in it, and I put that on the top to kind of like keep everything down under the water, and I take oh. a rock that I've boiled and cooled down, and I put it on top of the Ziploc bag to hold it down. Why do you have to boil your rocks? <laughs> Just, Just to so make they... it clean. Oh, okay. You, know, you don't want any other kind of bad bacteria to get in there. Right, And then right. I put the cap on tight, and I leave it on the counter for three days, uh-huh. and then I put it in the fridge. And then it's fermented in three days? Yeah, then it's fermented. I see. Wow. And so you can, and how long does a fermented, like, jar last? It could last, like, a long time, right? I yeah, mean, it lasts many, many, many months. Wow. Wow. Yep. Wow, oh, it is it is great. So do you live? So when you're not, so you grow your food in the summer, and you're yeah. living on fresh vegetables, and then, um, and then in the winter, do you live then on your on your preserved foods? Is that how you yep. live? Yep, pretty I mean, much. Isn't that a lot of salt in your diet, though? Or no, because awesome. you know when I freeze corn or I freeze broccoli, there's no salt there. And when I put the beets and the carrots and the potatoes in the root cellar, there's no salt there. And I, I, um, I, I do the sweet potatoes so that they'll keep, and there's no salt there. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of things that I eat that don't have salt. There is a little bit of salt in my fermented foods, but if you think about a teaspoon in a whole half a gallon jar, and it's really good quality salt too. I, I don't think right. we have to be afraid of good quality salt. Right. I think a lot of times it's the stuff, the other stuff like aluminum that comes in the table salt that we that we need to be aware of. Oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. So, I mean, so you're, you are pretty self sufficient So what kind of foods do you buy then? Because, you know, you sound like you really, you know, have it really handled. Well, I, have to, I buy my milk from a farmer, so that's raw milk, and I get my beef and bacon and, and that kind of stuff from another farmer because I don't, I don't grow everything here, so I, I don't have cows. I just have chickens. Um, right. So those are the kinds of things that I buy. I love Herbamar, which is a spice. I buy spices. Okay. But all the you know, vegetable. you live on all your own vegetables throughout the whole year, huh? I do. So you're not quite a farm, though. You're just a, how, like how many acres do you actually plant on your in, for you and your husband? It's it's hard to say, but it's probably like half an acre. I would say it's quite a oh, bit, actually. Only half an acre, though. That's 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 not too much of a long acre. That's a half an acre. <laughs> no, but, but that that's not that much. I mean, considering you you could plant like six acres or something, right? Well, I don't have any, I don't use any machines that use gasoline. It's all done with a shovel and a hoe and a bucket. And um, I, I move things around by the bucket full. So I'll take mm-hmm. my compost and I put it in the bucket and then I bring it over to the bed I'm working on and then I dump it on there. And I don't turn my beds anymore. I just kind of loosen not? them up because that uh, keeps all the, there's, there's a whole kingdom of of entities that live in the soil and when you turn the soil you disrupt that so i don't i don't turn my soil anymore i just loosen it up with a broad fork or a pitch fork and i plant on top and i add my soil amendments on top and i have really really beautiful plants and and wonderful vegetables they're just unbelievably delicious have you studied any of the finthorn stuff where people would um, meditate with their vegetables and plants and they have you done any My of that? My husband spent the year 1976 at Fintorn, the year before he met me, and then he took me back there in 77, so I've been there. So do you use some of those techniques for... Um... Yeah, I do. I, I talk to the plants, and a lot of times when I'm going to weed, I let the, let the bed know ahead of time that I'm going to weed, things like that. Does that have an effect, you feel? Oh, um, absolutely. The weeds what? come out easier if you warn them. 
Really? Yeah. Huh. Well, that's amazing. So, I mean, so you ha- do you have like a philosophy of, for your, you know, way of living and and farming? I mean, do you I think just... so. I think that everything ha- everything contains the vibration of everything that that has been through. So I want to be gentle on the earth. I want to be gentle with my plants. I want to be gentle with my chickens. You know, I want everybody to be happy and have a good life. You know, our chickens have a really big run. Um, Mm -hmm. They're spoiled, rotten chickens. I mean, they get all the weeds from the garden. And I used to, when I first got the chickens, I used to give them flax seeds because of the omega-3s that they have in them. And a friend of mine who's a nutritionist, she said, no, chickens can't digest flax seeds. They'll just pass right on through. So then I bought them flax meal. And my friend who's a nutritionist said, no, you know, flax meal, it goes rancid pretty quickly. So now my chickens get fresh ground flax meal (laughs) because I buy the seeds and I grind their flax meal fresh. Um, You know, so they are very healthy and their eggs are very healthy and we do eventually eat them and that's very healthy too. You eat your chickens? uh, You don't get attached? You eat, you're saying you eat your chickens? Eventually, yes. I don't name them and I don't get attached to them. They, don't, they, they have their own space, and it's not, like, right on top of where I live. It's, you know, down a little path. Do you, uh, so how old are they when you eat them? I mean... I keep you... them for two years, so they have a pretty good life. They get to go outside during the day and romp around and do dust baths and sit in the sun if they want or sit in the shade if they want. Um, they have a really nice run, and they're totally uh-huh. protected from predators. Right. And so, so do you hatch another... Um, crop of chickens then? Do you, do I don't you hatch, hatch them myself. I buy day old chicks and I, but I do raise them from a day old. Oh, okay. Cause it's too hard to sort of do that whole process of growing. Well, I don't ch- keep a, 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 um, a rooster. You oh, have have why a rooster is that? You want what? to have baby, baby chickens. And I don't keep What's a rooster that? because they're very noisy and they get kind of mean. Oh, they do? They, they Uh-oh. can be really mean. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So you buy, how much is a day old chick to buy? Um, you know, it really depends. It could be a dollar and a quarter to a dollar ninety. I mean, it's not that much. And then how long does it take for a chicken to have an egg? A chick from a day old chick to an egg bearing chicken? It takes about six months. Oh, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Five or and six they, months. And they don't lay eggs every day when they're young, right? They, they, they don't lay eggs every day, but I have about, right now I have about 19 chickens and I get between nine and 13 eggs a day. What do you do with all those eggs? I mean, you can't eat them. You sell them? Yeah, I sell a few, yeah. And I, I give them to friends and trade them for things. Wow. I'd love some fresh eggs like that every day. <laughs> they are really, really good too. What is the, what is the yolk of a really fresh egg look like? It's, um, it's orangey. And it really stands right up by itself. It, it definitely has a, it doesn't look pale and it doesn't look flat or wan. And um, it, it just really stands up when you, like if you make a sunny side up egg, or you can, ta- you know, pour it into the pan and that egg yolk just stays right up. It's nice. So if you, if you break an egg and Im- immediately the yolk breaks, that's not a, a good sign of a good egg, is it? It's probably not a good sign, no. Uh huh. Well, this is pe- These are things people in in the cities do not have any idea about. Really, they mm-hmm. just. I mean, well, that's it, why I wrote my book because I think it's you know I think people are you know our grand our great grandparents knew all this stuff pretty instinctually, but they're gone now, and people are finally I think starting to really take a look at what we're eating and where does our food come from. So I wrote the book as a guide for people to be able to take charge of, of these things somewhat again yeah no i think it's a beautiful book it's really a lot of great pictures and you have a lot of great um sort of recipes or things to do i think the people we need more of this these kind of books so people could understand you know how to deal with their own food and 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 grow their own thing. So, do you keep your own seeds then do, i mean you don't i mean how do you like the stuff you're not buying seeds of, what kind of foods do you then keep of your own that you can plant the next season with from you know, your own seeds? I don't seeds? keep my own seeds, but the reason that I don't keep my own seeds is I don't really have enough space to have, like you have to have, if you want to keep your seeds, you have to only do one variety in one place. 
And I like to get a lot of different kinds of varieties of different tomatoes. I probably have, I have 30 tomato plants out in my garden right now, and I probably have 20 different varieties in those 30 plants. So none of those seeds are going to be true to the, to the parent because they're going to cross. Oh, and that's so what's I, wrong with that. I do buy my seeds. I, I know there is a movement now for seed saving, and I think that's very good. And I think we should probably be doing more seed saving. But I don't, I don't have, I don't do that because I don't grow just one variety of things. Oh, I see. Well, what it's okay. What's wrong if they cross seeds? Can't you keep seeds that have been crossed? Oh, yeah, you would, but it, you wouldn't come up with the same exact plant. It would be a, a totally different plant. Oh. And, and and but that would be okay too, right? But well, it would, yeah, it would be okay, you know. But I like certain varieties mm-hmm. for different reasons, right? right. Uh, you know, you I, like I have my taste. favorites, right? So if you have a tomato plant, does that tomato plant bear bear tomatoes all summer long? Yeah, once they start, it it keeps going until the frost. Really? Because tomatoes here, even at the farmers market, are really expensive. They're like. Two and a half dollars a pound, or something like that, and, you know? and they're much more expensive here right now because the, the only tomatoes you can get here right now have been hothouse tomatoes, and they're six fifty a pound. Really, but your tomatoes are, are are growing now, right? Well, they're starting to grow. They're not red yet. I did buy a plant that has little great little cherry tomatoes on it that I'm eating, but. Um, uh. I I don't have any tomatoes from my regular garden yet, but it looks like I'll have them in about three weeks. Well, it, now it's like late June. What do you have now that you're eating? I'm eating Swiss chard, beet greens, lots of lettuce, radicchio. Um, let's see what else am I eating. Snow peas. The snow peas are coming in really nice. The next mm-hmm. time I thin the beets and the carrots, they'll be big enough to eat. So by another week, I'll have beets and carrots as well. And I should be getting my summer squash pretty soon. Uh, uh, do you grow watermelon up there? Um, I can. I have a, a musk melon that I planted this year. So a we'll musk. see how that does. We, I won't get that until August. You know, Probably because not person, until late August. But, you know, I cannot find any watermelons anywhere, even the health food stores that have the black seeds in them. They're all been... Is that GMO'd or is just because mm, well, they don't... Not probably, it might not be GMO's, but it's kind of weird. <laughs> it is weird because they don't even taste like you don't. They don't even have a taste anymore. These watermelons right. without the seeds. Well, so, find I mean, a, do you do you go? To, you said you go to the farmers market, right? Yeah, it's hard to. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's wart. I mean, I think they come in at the end of the season. I right. think. The, I think that's probably true. It's probably too early. But go yeah, the to the war- farmers market and talk to your farmers and tell them. Look, I want, you know, I want watermelons with seeds and ask them if they grow that. And if they do, they'll let you know and they'll let you know when to expect them. Because the farmers right. know. You know, they know they know about food and they know how to grow food, but they know when it's going to be ready and what the different kind of varieties are. And if you let them know that you're interested in a specific variety, then they'll probably grow some for you. Yeah, let me ask you about one more thing in your book. You talk about bone broth. You know, there was a store that opened up in New York that just sold bone broth. But what is the secret to bone broth? Um, I think it's the collagen and the gelatin that you get out of the bones. I mean, I discovered, I don't even remember how I discovered this, but I discovered over 30 years ago that if my husband and I have at least two servings of my homemade bone broth soup a week, we have no problems with our joints. Really? And sometimes I forget, and if I forget, my knees start to really bother me. Uh-huh. So what but do you my do? My bone broth soup, I cook it for two days at a very low simmer. Wait, so what do you actually cook? You take bones from a cow, beef bones? I, okay, I, beef, chicken, turkey, or lamb. If you're going to use beef bones, I, I, I bake them for about an hour before I put them in. It just gives it a little better flavor. Everything you else can just go bones. directly into the soup. Plus, I Wait, always... So, so- Wait, wait, let me just ask you, do you first, like, cook a steak, and then you scrape the bone, and put the bone, uh, after you bake it in a pot of water, is that it? Well, you could, you know, and I I often do that with chicken and turkey, I'll bake a chicken or a turkey, and then I'll make soup with the bones, Uh Um, but the beef bones, you can buy beef bones, you can buy beef bones for stock, and what I usually do is I get together with three friends, and we buy a whole cow, so you do get 
you know, uh, soup bones when you buy the whole cow. You buy so a whole cow. I would bake with, in the oven with, for maybe an hour, and then I would put them in the soup. Wait, let me just and, ask you. Um, I the, always put chicken feet you, in the soup. No, you, you buy the cow with all the meat on it and all the internal organs. Is that what you do? Yeah, and it's all it's all been butchered and and, and broken up and and put into different packaging. Uh huh. How and, much? And it's frozen, uh, so we buy it frozen, much, and we just sep- we just separate it all out. You know, hamburger, hamburger, what? hamburger, hamburger. Wait, so, so how much does it cost? There's things to buy- left, and then we just go around and pick one at a time. How much does it cost to buy a cow, a, or a third of a cow? Well, I the last time I bought a quarter cow, I came home with two great big, huge boxes full of meat, full of steaks and roasts and hamburger, and it was all grass-fed, and it cost me a little over $500. So, And that lasted you probably a few months, or what? No, that lasted most of a year. That last a quarter cow lasted you most of the year. How many times would you eat meat then? Once a um, week or twice? I eat meat fairly often. So a couple of times a week would a quarter yeah, cow would, I would last say a couple you times old? a week. Really, a, that's just a really amazing statistic that a quarter cow would last you a whole year, even eating meat a couple of times, and it would all be frozen until you ate it, right? Yep. Yep. I see. No, that's that. I have no idea. That's really interesting. Okay, getting back. So you have the you bake your bones for an hour, then you throw it into a pot of water. Yeah, quali- wa- really good quality cold water. And I always put in beets and carrots. And if it's the summertime, I'll put in the beet tops and the carrot tops. I always put in a little piece of really good quality liver. Um, because the thing about soup is vitamins and minerals are water soluble. So they go into the water, and that's why you're making the soup and you're you're cooking all this stuff. But you're you're pulling the vitamins and the minerals and the collagen and the gelatin out of the bones, and it all goes into the water. And I also add a little bit of um, either vinegar or white wine because that also helps the 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 stuff come out of the bones. And I'll cook it on a low low simmer, just to, just barely boiling for two days. Two days. And then I strain all that out and I put it in freezer can pints, which can go in the freezer. And then when I want some, I just take out a pint and heat it up and put it in two cups and we drink it. Wait, wait. So you just keep it on a low, not simmering, but it's hot. This water's hot. It's boiling, but a very low boil, not a rolling boil. For two days. Two days. That's a lot of gas. I mean, if you have a gas stove, it's a lot of gas though, right? Well, or you can put it, you can do it in a crock pot. Oh, you can do it in a crock pot? Yep, you can do it in a crock pot. Oh, okay. Okay, so you do it in a crock pot, and then you do that for, ju- all you need is two days to yep. cook all that? Two continuous days. And then, okay, you pour, you get rid of the bones, you keep the liquid, and then you don't, you just keep it in your refrigerator. You don't freeze the liquid, do no, you? No, I freeze it. You freeze yeah, the liquid? freeze it, because I get... I will get maybe, you know, 12, 14, 16 pints out of a big pot of soup like that. How big so is the pot? We're not going to be able to eat that up right away, so I freeze it in can. They're called can or freeze pints, uh-huh. um, so you can get them at the, at the supermarket or the hardware store. But, and you, you can't put them in regular canning jars because they'll break regular canning jars, but it, 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 on the box it will say it, can or freeze jars. But... I- so, how big is the pot you start with for the... It's a pretty big pot. The largest, the, it could be the largest um, crock pot that I can find. Or I mean, a, like a... Gall- is that like, like a, a one big gallon pot? Like you pot might pot. find in a, in a restaurant kitchen. I mean, not humongous, but, but quite large. Like I, I like to get a large turkey for Thanksgiving, so I often will get a 30-pound turkey. Right. So, so you need kind okay. of a big pot to put all those bones in. Mm. But it makes a delicious soup. Right. So let me just ask you about planting a little bit. When you get your seeds um, in the spring, I guess there, you, you plant certain seeds at certain uh, times of the spring. Do you plant like on a full moon or new moon? Do you, do you listen to that kind of like kind of folklore? I think it's good to do that. But I have 18 or 20 days in April and I have 18 or 20 days in May that I'm planting So there aren't that many, like, ideal days in April or May. So Mm -hmm. pretty much I plant when I'm home and it's not raining. 
So you plant it right in the ground outside. You put most, a dig a most things I do, yes. Do you have anything you plant inside and transplant to outside? Sometimes I'll start things inside, like some lettuces or some squashes or uh, whatever. Sometimes I'll, I'll grow my own onions. I'll start them inside. Um, but a lot of stuff gets planted right into the ground outside, the beets, the carrots, most of the lettuces, most of the broccolis and the cabbages and all the other brassicas and the beans, um, radicchio. Um, do you, do you, you, know, do you still stars, think it's a, it gets planted right into the ground? Do you still think it's a miracle every time, like a little seed sprouts? I mean, I yes, think I do. <laughs> you do. It is pretty amazing that you know, just this little seed can grow a whole plant that can feed the planet. I mean, well, like they teach at Findhorn, it's the seed isn't alone. The seed is helped by the little gnomes and the little earth beings, and um, you know, all the rest of it. So it's the mm. seed plus what, whatever else is there. Well, just talk about planting garlic a little bit. Do you t- plant like a, you know, there's a whole clove. Do you take parts of that clove and plant it, or do you plant the whole clove in the ground? No, you take the, pe- you know, each individual, the, the garlic that you buy in the store, you yeah. and, and don't try to plant the garlic you buy in the store. Get it from a, a nursery. You would take uh-huh. each individual clove and plant the individual cloves, and garlic gets planted in October. It is? And it mm-hmm. sits in the ground all winter? It's in the ground. Garlic never stops growing. So gr- garlic actually grows in the ground in the winter, and when the snow melts, usually it's already up. Wait, the thing you buy in the store, the bulb, is that something you dig out of the ground, or is that above the ground? That's Well, the thing you buy in the store is something that you eventually are going to dig out of the ground. That's oh. where it grows. But what you do is you take the different pieces, you split it up into its individual pieces, and you plant the individual pieces in the ground. And you do that in October, and then I mulch it. So I put some leaves on top of it, and I, put, I take my sunflower stems, and I put them on the leaves so that the leaves stay there and they don't blow all over the place. And then in the spring, when the snow melts, I take that all off, and, and the garlic is already up and growing. So each one of those individual sections of a garlic will grow its own, like, whole garlic bowl. Yep. yep. That's pretty amazing. Huh? Yep. Do you, do you, do you, how much garlic do you grow for yourself? I plant 10 pounds. 10 pounds? So I grow and a lot ma- of garlic, but I make my own garlic powder. You do? How do you make garlic powder? <laughs> well, you take the garlics, and, and they, I usually harvest them in about the middle of July. You want to mm-hmm. harvest garlic when there's four green leaves left, because it starts with maybe eight or ten green leaves, and then they start to turn brown. And when there's four green leaves left, that's the perfect time to harvest garlic. So I harvest the garlic, and then I tie it up in bunches of eight, and I put it in a place that has good ventilation, like a porch. You don't want to put it in the sun, but on a porch. And I leave it there for about two weeks. And then I take all the cloves, so I take the garlics apart, and I cut the top and the bottom off, and I put it in my dehydrator. Yes. Overnight, because that makes it easier to get all the skin off the garlics, because that's a you know it's a lot of work to skin all the garlics. So then yes. I take the garlic and I take all the skin off. Then I put it in my food processor and I slice it, mm-hmm. and I put it back in the dehydrator, and it stays in the dehydrator for a good seven days because I uh-huh. I do it at a low temperature under 115 degrees because that somewhat keeps the medicinal qualities of the garlic there. If you make it hotter than that, you're going to lose that. And I stir it a couple of times, and then at the end of seven days, it's really, really dry. So then Uh I put it in the blender, and you just hit chop, and it makes it into powder. And I put it into jars through a strainer so that anything that didn't get chopped up small goes back into the blender. And what do you do with garlic powder then? Then I give it to all my kids for Christmas, and I give it to my friends for Christmas. (laughs) But what do you just add it as a seasoning? Is that the, yeah? What you do? Well, I I will put it on. Um, you know, I can make garlic bread and put it on with the butter. I can make um, a stir fry and just put it on with that. You can put it on anything. It's just it's like a condiment or you know like like and a salt shaker. It comes you. out wow. just like salt. Wow! But you know, I have to tell you, this all sounds like a lot of hard work. Everything you're doing, you know, it's. It's, well, it is. It does. It is time consuming, and it it does take time. But yeah. I, it saves me a ton of money. So instead of going out and working for money and and trying uh, to buy this stuff, I'm doing this instead. So I don't right. need a lot of money. 
Right. No, and of course the food is a much higher quality. Oh, it's so. amazing. It's just amazing. And and the, the food that you can cook with this stuff, when I make meals, they're just they're just so delicious. It's it's almost unbelievable. It's, it's um there's nothing like it. I mean, I don't even like other people's carrots anymore. Wow. Well, <laughs> Beth and I will have to come up to visit, okay? You will have to come up to visit. I've told her definitely. Please uh, do. Okay, that would be great. So, you know, I really do like your book, and of course, a lot of the, what we talked about here is in your book, Celeste Garden. Celeste Garden delights. Discover the many ways a garden can nurture you. This, I mean, it is all about nurturing. So, what do you want people to like um, really get from this interview and the book? What would you like to leave them with? Well, I'd like people to know that that you know things are more under your control than you think. And uh, hopefully the book will help you to see that and will help give you some ideas about things that you can do that will improve your health, um, improve your stability, and, and give you the power to do things for yourself that are, you know, have unbelievable benefits. It just the, the benefits are, are too numerous to, to name. Um, and it, it feels good. You know, I enjoy what I do. It's work, but it doesn't feel like work because I'm enjoying it. And mm-hmm. also, I know that it's really good for me, and I'm extremely healthy, very, very healthy. And my husband is, too. Right. And, you, and did you, you publish this book for yourself? Is this it? I did. So if people want to order the book, they go to your website. Is that the best way? That's a good way to do it. And my website is CelesteLongacre.com. And there is an E at the end of both of my names. It's a little tricky. Oh, Celeste with an E. C-E-L-E-S-T-E. Longacre.com. Yep. And it's great. No, it's a beautiful book. Uh, uh, thank you for giving us all the tips there. I'm going to read the rest of the book and, you know, do some of these things. Because even if you're living in the city, you can, I mean, just fermenting is, is becoming a popular pastime, like I said. And Yeah, you know, I, I think it's the missing piece in Americans' diet. I think, I think we, we won't really have optimal health until we start to do fermenting again. I think you're right. So many people have digestive issues yep. and, and yep. they're missing the probiotics. I, I, I think this is great. This is a great way to get your gut back, gut health back in shape. So you're right. You're right. Well, thank you, Celeste. It's really been fun. Oh, my pleasure, Alan. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I will uh, recommend this book to a lot of people, and um, and when I post this interview, I'll post the book on my website too. So, um, awesome. thanks. Yes, thanks again. And oh, one more thing we didn't talk about is that you've been an astrologer for the Old Farmers Almanac. What? What? Yep. What do you? How? Do, what? You know, they make these amazing predictions. The Old Farmers Almanac. How do they do that through your astrology? Well, that, I do the astrological table, which is the best days to begin diet to lose weight, best day to begin diet to gain weight, best day to cut hair for slow growth, best day to cut hair for fast growth. Um, it's a whole chart that I do for them, and that is based on astrology. They don't make their other predictions based on astrology, and I'm not really 100% sure how they make those predictions, but I do the astrological stuff for them. How do you know what day is a good day to cut your hair for slow growth or plant seed? I mean, how do you know? Where the moon, what sign the moon is in and if it's a waxing or a waning moon. And that from the new moon to the full moon, the moon is waxing, so the moon is increasing in light. So uh-huh. that would be a time to cut hair for fast growth. And I, I pick signs like Libra, which are, you know, harmonious, pretty signs. Um, and so it's where the moon is and what's phase of the moon is in. So it's the, the moon's astrological sign and the moon's phase, and that's what I base it on. Oh, I see. So uh, uh, a, wax, a waning moon would be slow growth, right? right. Yep. Uh, and you, and also, like you don't ever want to open a bank account under a waning moon because you don't want it to shrink. You want it to grow. So you uh, would always want to open a bank account on a waxing moon. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay, yeah, and planting, do you follow that for planting as well? Well, I do if I can. Like I said, I just ha- yeah. I have to plant so many days in April and May that I, I don't have the luxury 
of just being able to plant on those good days. But when I plant stuff inside that I'm going to transplant outside, I will definitely plant them on good days. Uh, so what kind of astrologer would you call yourself? Uh, uh, agricultural astrologer? No, what would you call no, yourself? No, I mean, I, I, when I do readings for people, I kind of specialize in relationships. Oh, um, I see. But, okay. Yeah. That's and, good and what know. you know? What is your path? What is what is the path your, that you came here to do? Uh huh. Okay. And, um, okay. That's kind of what yes. I do with astrology. Okay. Yes. All right. Um. Thank you for talking tonight. And um. Yeah, I appreciate it. And um. Yeah. So we'll be in touch. Okay. Okay. It's been fun, and definitely come and visit. Yes, I'd love to come up there and eat out of your garden. So yeah, um, it's wonderful. Okay. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'll just say uh, I've been. I've been talking to Celeste Longacre. This is Alan Steinfeld for New Realities, and thanks for listening. And thank you, Celeste. And thank you for having me. All right, we'll be in touch. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Talk soon. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye.